I glanced over at Jack, his hand steady on the wheel as our car glided through the rolling hills of rural Pennsylvania. The sun had set hours ago, and the sky was an inky black, save for the occasional flicker of stars. We were on our way to a family reunion, hoping to reconnect with relatives we hadn't seen in years. The thought of familiar faces and shared memories made me smile. Jack had suggested taking a scenic route through Dark Hollow, a remote area renowned for its picturesque views. It seemed like a good idea at the time, a chance to enjoy some tranquility before the chaos of the reunion. However, as the miles stretched on, the road became narrower and more desolate. There were no street lights, just the faint glow of our headlights cutting through the darkness. Jack, are you sure this is the right way? I asked, a hint of unease creeping into my voice. Yeah, I'm following the GPS. We should be there in no time, Marie. He reassured me with a confident smile. Just as I began to relax, the car sputtered and lurched. Jack's smile faded as he pulled over to the side of the road. He tried to restart the engine, but it wouldn't turn over. We were stranded. Jack fiddled with the engine while I held the flashlight, its beam casting eerie shadows on the trees lining the deserted highway. Despite his efforts, it soon became clear we were out of our depth. The engine wouldn't turn over, and we didn't have the tools or expertise to diagnose the problem. We need professional help, Jack muttered, frustration evident in his voice. As the minutes ticked by and darkness settled in, our anxiety grew. The vast emptiness around us felt increasingly oppressive, and the realization that we were utterly alone gnawed at my nerves. Just as despair began to set in, the faint rumble of an approaching vehicle broke the silence. A pair of headlights appeared in the distance, growing brighter as they neared. Jack and I exchanged a hopeful glance. The truck, an old beat-up pickup, pulled up beside us, and the driver rolled down his window. Need some help? The man behind the wheel was in his fifties, with a friendly smile and a reassuring demeanor. He introduced himself as Tom. Relief washed over us as we explained our predicament. No problem at all, Tom said warmly. I can tow you to my place. I've got tools there. Grateful for the assistance, Jack and I accepted Tom's offer. He hooked our car to his truck, and we climbed into the cab with him. The interior smelled faintly of old leather and motor oil, oddly comforting in our stressful situation. As we drove, Tom chatted amiably, asking about our trip and plans. There was something slightly off about his overly insistent hospitality, but I dismissed it as my nerves getting the better of me. Jack seemed comfortable enough, engaging in conversation and even laughing at a few of Tom's jokes. After a short drive, we arrived at Tom's farmhouse. It was isolated, surrounded by dense woods, and the only light came from a single bulb on the porch. He directed us to a large, weather-beaten barn where he promised to look at our car in the morning. Why don't you stay the night? Tom suggested. I've got a guest room and it's too late to go anywhere now. Despite a nagging feeling of unease, we reluctantly agreed. Tom's demeanor remained warm, but his questions grew increasingly peculiar, making me more uncomfortable. As we settled into the guest room, I couldn't shake the sense that something was terribly wrong. Make yourselves comfortable, Tom said, flashing that same warm smile. As he left us alone, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, and the silence of the house seemed to press in from all sides. Inside the farmhouse, Jack and I began to notice strange things that heightened our unease. The walls were adorned with old photographs, but it was the stack of outdated newspapers that caught my eye. Each one featured missing person reports, their faces staring back at me with haunting desperation. The air felt heavy, and every creak of the floorboard set my nerves on edge. As we explored further, we found several locked doors, their presence adding to the growing sense of dread. From the basement came odd, muffled noises that seemed to grow louder the longer we listened. Jack tried to rationalize it, suggesting it was just the house settling, but I wasn't so sure. Jack, ever the pragmatist, tried to dismiss my concerns. Marie, we're exhausted. Our minds are playing tricks on us. Let's just get some sleep and figure this out in the morning. That night, I lay wide awake, every creak and groan of the old house amplifying my anxiety. Jack was asleep beside me. Suddenly, I heard soft footsteps outside our room, followed by hushed whispers. My heart raced as I quietly slipped out of bed and approached the door. 
Peering through the keyhole, I saw Tom speaking with an unknown person, their conversation urgent and tense. Something isn't right, Jack, I whispered, shaking him awake. His eyes widened as I relayed what I had seen. Our sense of dread deepened, and we knew we had to leave immediately. We tiptoed out of the guest room and made our way to the barn. But as Jack tried to start the car, it became evident that it had been tampered with. It wouldn't turn over. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped. We need to go now, I urged, my voice trembling. Jack nodded, and we bolted from the barn, hoping to make it to the main road on foot. We had barely made it a few yards from the barn when a flashlight beam cut through the darkness, and Tom's voice called out, eerily calm. Where do you think you're going? We froze and Tom approached us, his previously warm demeanor now menacing. You're not leaving. It's not safe out there at night. Desperation flooded through me as I looked at Jack, pleading silently for a solution. My mind raced, searching for a way out of this nightmare. Back in the guest room, Tom locked the door from the outside. I heard the jingle of keys and his footsteps receding down the hall. Jack and I sat in silence, the weight of our predicament pressing down on us. The realization that we were prisoners in this isolated farmhouse was suffocating. We have to find another way out, I whispered, my voice barely audible. Jack nodded, his face grim. I began to formulate a plan, considering every possibility. The window seemed like our best option, but we needed to wait for the right moment. As we waited for the opportune moment to escape, I began searching the guest room for anything that could help us. In the back of a dusty drawer, I found an old leather-bound journal. My hands trembled as I opened it, flipping through pages filled with meticulous handwriting. The entries detailed Tom's involvement in a series of disappearances, each more horrifying than the last. He described luring unsuspecting travelers, much like us, into his farmhouse under the guise of offering help. My blood ran cold as I read further. The journal revealed that Tom was part of a criminal gang trafficking people. The entries included names, dates, and gruesome details of how they were handed over to the gang. It was a sickening account of his twisted activities. The latest entry sent a chill down my spine. Tom planned to contact the gang the next morning to arrange our pickup. Panic and anger surged through me. We had to act fast. Jack, look at this, I whispered urgently, showing him the journal. His face paled as he read the damning evidence. We can't wait. We need to stop him now. Fueled by a mix of fear and determination, Jack and I devised a plan to confront Tom. We couldn't afford to wait until morning. Quietly, we crept out of the guest room, clutching the journal as our evidence. We found Tom in the kitchen, casually drinking a cup of coffee, his back turned to us. My heart pounded as I stepped forward, holding the journal tightly. Tom, we need to talk, I said my voice steady despite my fear. He turned, his expression shifting from surprise to cold calculation. Found my journal, did you? He said, his voice devoid of the warmth it once held. The facade had dropped, revealing the true predator underneath. We're not going to let you hurt anyone else, Jack said, stepping beside me. Tom's eyes narrowed, and in an instant, he lunged at us. The kitchen erupted into chaos. Jack grappled with Tom, trying to pin him down, but Tom was surprisingly strong. Thinking quickly, I grabbed a cast iron skillet from the stove and swung it with all my might, hitting Tom squarely on the head. He crumpled to the floor, dazed, but not unconscious. Quick, tie him up, I urged Jack, as we used whatever we could find to restrain Tom. We couldn't waste another second. Our lives depended on escaping this nightmare. We managed to drag Tom to the basement, locking the door securely behind him. Desperation fueling our actions, we found a working vehicle in a nearby shed. The old truck roared to life, and we sped through the night, the fear of pursuit driving us onward. We reached the nearest town and contacted Sheriff Davis, who quickly organized a raid on Tom's farmhouse. The raid uncovered a trove of evidence, confirming the trafficking ring's existence. Though safe, Jack and I were deeply shaken our ordeal a chilling reminder of the lurking dangers behind seemingly friendly faces. Driving through Pittsburgh at night had become a routine for me. As a part-time rideshare driver juggling my job and night classes, the darkened streets were my workspace. 
One late evening, as I waited for my next ride request, the app pinged, directing me to pick up a passenger named Mark. I pulled up to the address and saw him standing there, a tall, lanky figure with a hoodie pulled tight over his head. As he slid into the back seat, I noticed how he kept glancing over his shoulder, his eyes darting around nervously. Good evening. Where to? I asked, trying to sound cheerful despite the uneasy vibe he exuded. Just drive. I'll give you directions as we go, he replied, his voice strained. I nodded, starting the car and pulling away from the curb. Mark's destination turned out to be an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. I'd heard stories about that area, none of them good, but a fair was a fair, and I needed the money. The ride was eerily quiet. Mark barely spoke, his eyes glued to his phone as if waiting for something. Every few minutes his phone would buzz, and he'd have a hushed, frantic conversation that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. His anxiety was palpable, and it was making me uneasy. I tried to focus on the road, but my curiosity got the better of me. Everything okay back there? I asked, glancing at him through the rearview mirror. He looked up, his face pale. Just keep driving, he muttered, avoiding eye contact. As we neared the warehouse, Mark suddenly leaned forward. Take the next left, then a right. Avoid the main road. His sudden request for a detour through a less populated area only heightened my suspicion. Why was he so keen on avoiding well-lit streets? My mind raced with possibilities, each one more unsettling than the last. Was he in trouble? Was I in trouble? I took the turns as directed, the streets growing darker and more desolate with each passing block. Mark's phone buzzed again, and this time, he didn't bother to lower his voice. I'm almost there. Just a few more minutes, he said urgently before ending the call. A few blocks from the warehouse, Mark finally asked me to stop. He fumbled with his wallet, handed me a wad of cash, and practically bolted from the car. Thanks, he muttered, already moving away. I watched him disappear into the darkness, my curiosity turning to worry. As he walked, I noticed a shadowy figure stepping out from an alley, following him at a distance. A chill ran down my spine. Something was definitely wrong. I wanted to call out to Mark, warn him, but my voice caught in my throat. The two figures vanished into the night, leaving me alone in the deserted street. The next day, as I sipped my coffee and scrolled through the news on my phone, a headline caught my eye. Missing person. Have you seen this man? The photo accompanying the article made my heart skip a beat. It was Mark, the same nervous passenger I had dropped off the night before. My mind raced with questions. What had happened to him after he left my car? Who was that shadowy figure following him? And most importantly, was he still alive? I couldn't shake the feeling that I was now somehow involved in whatever trouble Mark had been running from. The fear and curiosity gnawed at me, refusing to let go. The next day, unable to shake off the unsettling feeling, I decided to contact the police. I provided them with all the details I could remember about Mark and our ride. Detective Harris, a gruff but attentive officer, questioned me thoroughly, jotting down every word I said. He seemed really scared, I recounted. Kept looking over his shoulder, taking secretive phone calls. I dropped him off near an abandoned warehouse, and there was someone following him. Detective Harris nodded but looked skeptical. Without solid evidence, there's not much we can do right now, he admitted. But we'll keep an eye on it. As I left the station, a gnawing sense of fear and responsibility took hold. What if I was the last person to see Mark alive? The thought was too much to bear. I knew I had to find out what happened to him, even if it meant putting myself at risk. Determined to uncover the truth, I drove back to the warehouse area, my eyes scanning every corner for clues. After hours of searching, I stumbled upon something in an alley nearby. Mark's phone, slightly battered but still functional, my hands trembled as I picked it up and managed to unlock it using the fingerprint sensor. The phone was a treasure trove of disturbing messages and calls from an unknown number. The messages were cryptic, but hinted at a dangerous situation. You can't hide forever, one read. We will find you, threatened another. Suddenly my own phone buzzed with a new message from an unknown number. Stop looking, or you'll be next. My blood ran cold. Someone was watching me 
and they didn't want me digging any further. But now, I was even more determined to get to the bottom of this mystery. Piecing together the fragments from Mark's phone, I discovered that he was involved in a dangerous black market dealing with illegal goods. He had stolen something valuable from a powerful criminal organization, and they were hunting him down to get it back. One of the messages on Mark's phone stood out. Meet me at the warehouse. We need to expose them. It seemed Mark was trying to blow the whistle on the criminal ring before he disappeared. This revelation sent chills down my spine. I was now entangled in a web of criminal activities that could easily put my life in jeopardy. Despite the growing danger, I knew I couldn't stop. Mark had been trying to do the right thing, and I felt compelled to see it through. I arranged a meeting with the person Mark was supposed to meet the night he disappeared. Using the information from Mark's phone, I set up a rendezvous at a small cafe on the outskirts of town. My heart pounded as I sat at a corner table, waiting. When a man approached, his eyes darting around nervously, I knew I had found the contact. You must be Rachel, he whispered. We need to talk. Before we could exchange more than a few words, the door burst open and two men stormed in. Get her! One of them shouted. Panic surged through me as I realized it was a trap. Using quick thinking, I threw my coffee in one man's face and bolted for the back exit. As I ran, I overheard them discussing plans to eliminate anyone investigating Mark's disappearance. It fueled my desperation to escape and get help. The criminals, now desperate to silence me, kidnapped me that night. They blindfolded me and took me to the same abandoned warehouse where Mark had vanished. My heart raced as I tried to calm my breathing, focusing on finding a way out. In the dim light, I managed to loosen my bindings using a rusty nail protruding from a wooden beam. With a burst of adrenaline, I freed myself and stealthily moved through the warehouse, avoiding the guards. Finding a phone in a deserted office, I called the authorities. Minutes felt like hours, until I heard the sound of police sirens approaching. A dramatic showdown ensued, with the police bursting in and arresting the criminals. Detective Harris himself led the charge, rescuing me from my captors. Relief washed over me as I saw the criminals being taken away in handcuffs. Rachel's bravery and determination led to the dismantling of the criminal organization. The police investigation revealed that Mark had been killed by the criminals, but his efforts were not in vain. His attempts to expose the ring helped bring them to justice. Though hailed as a hero, I was left with lingering fears and a newfound wariness of the world around me. The story ends with me driving again, more cautious, but determined to move forward. I contemplated the thin line between safety and danger, knowing how easily a routine night can turn into a nightmare. Ongoing investigations hinted at more layers to the criminal network, leaving an eerie sense of unfinished business. Driving from Pittsburgh to New York City for a job interview was supposed to be an exciting adventure, a chance to start fresh. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows on the highway. I'd been driving for hours, my eyes straining against the dim light. As I neared Scranton, Pennsylvania, I decided to take a break and stretch my legs. A rest stop sign gleamed ahead, promising a brief respite. I pulled into the rest stop, noting how eerily quiet it was. Only a few cars dotted the parking lot, their occupants nowhere to be seen. I parked my car and stepped out, the evening air cool against my skin. The silence felt heavy, almost oppressive, but I tried to shake off the unease creeping up my spine. As I locked my car, I noticed a man leaning against a nearby vehicle, his eyes fixed on me. He was tall and had a scruffy appearance, his gaze intense and unyielding. A shiver ran through me, but I told myself I was being paranoid. It was just a rest stop after all. I headed toward the restroom, quickening my pace. Inside, the flickering fluorescent lights did little to ease my nerves. I splashed some water on my face, taking a moment to breathe. When I stepped out, my heart sank. The same man was there, closer now, his eyes still locked on me. Hey there, he said, his voice low and unsettling. Long drive? Yeah. I replied curtly, avoiding eye contact, just passing through. He took a step closer, his presence overwhelming. Where are you headed? New York, I muttered, taking a step back. 
My discomfort must have been evident because he smirked, his eyes gleaming with something that sent alarm bells ringing in my head. I decided then and there to leave. Quickly. Have a good night, I said, forcing a polite smile before turning on my heel and walking briskly to my car. My heart pounded as I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the door open. I glanced back to see him still watching me, his expression unreadable. As I sped out of the parking lot, my unease turned into a gnawing fear. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Back on the highway, the adrenaline from my encounter with the creepy man began to fade, replaced by a growing sense of dread. Glancing in my rearview mirror, my heart skipped a beat. There he was, his car a dark silhouette against the fading light, following me at a distance. I tried to tell myself it was just a coincidence, but the nagging fear wouldn't go away. I pressed my foot on the accelerator, speeding up in hopes of losing him. But as I weaved through traffic and took random exits, he remained on my tail, never losing sight of me. My hands gripped the steering wheel, knuckles white with tension. My mind raced with possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. Why was he following me? What did he want? Panic set in, my breaths coming in shallow gasps as I realized he wasn't giving up. No matter how fast I drove or how many turns I took, he stayed right behind me, like a predator stalking its prey. Desperation clawed at me as I spotted a gas station up ahead. I swerved into the parking lot, my tires screeching against the pavement. Without wasting a second, I jumped out of the car and ran inside, the bell above the door jingling loudly. The clerk, a middle-aged man with kind eyes, looked up from his magazine, startled. Can I help you? He asked. Please, you have to help me, I panted, my voice shaking. There's a man following me. I think he means to harm me. Concern flashed across his face, and he immediately reached for the phone. I'll call the police. Just stay here. I nodded, my eyes darting around the store as I tried to calm my racing heart. The minutes felt like hours as I waited, each second dragging on in agonizing silence. The clerk spoke softly into the phone, glancing at me with reassuring nods. Finally, the faint sound of sirens pierced the stillness of the night. Relief washed over me, but it was tempered by the persistent fear that the man was still out there, watching and waiting. I hugged my arms to myself, trying to shake the feeling of being hunted, knowing the police would soon arrive to put an end to this nightmare. The police arrived within minutes, their flashing lights casting an eerie glow over the gas station. I ran out to meet them, pointing wildly in the direction where I last saw the car. But to my utter disbelief, there was no sign of him or his vehicle. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Officer Davis, a tall, no-nonsense cop with a stern expression, took my statement. I recounted everything. The rest stop, the man's unsettling behavior, the relentless chase, and my desperate flight to the gas station. We'll keep an eye out for him, Officer Davis assured me, his voice calm but authoritative. In the meantime, try to stay calm and continue your journey. We'll patrol the area and see if we can find him. Despite his words, a lingering sense of dread clung to me as I got back into my car. The police presence provided little comfort. The image of the man in tense gaze was burned into my mind, and I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. With a heavy heart, I continued my drive, eyes constantly flicking to the rearview mirror. Exhaustion hit me hard by the time I reached a small motel for the night. My nerves were frayed, and my body ached from the tension. I checked in barely noticing the friendly smile of the receptionist, and dragged myself to my room, craving the escape of sleep. Just as I was about to drift off, my phone rang, startling me. It was Officer Davis. We found the car, his name is Mike, and he is known by our services, he said. It was abandoned not far from the gas station. We're looking into it, but I wanted to let you know we're taking this seriously. Relief washed over me momentarily but it was quickly replaced by a cold, creeping fear. I thanked him and hung up, trying to take solace in the fact that the police were on the case. As I prepared for bed, I noticed a slip of paper under the door. My heart pounded as I picked it up, dread pooling in my stomach. The note was brief but chilling. I know where you are. Panic surged through me, 
Mike had somehow tracked me to this motel. I felt trapped. Every shadow in the room seeming to loom larger. Every creak of the building magnified in my ears. The nightmare was far from over, and I knew I couldn't let my guard down for a second. My hands trembled as I dialed the police again, my voice barely steady as I explained the situation. He's here. Mike is here. And he knows where I am, I whispered, trying to keep my panic in check. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way, but it felt like a lifetime. I pushed the dresser against the door, creating a makeshift barricade, and clutched my phone, listening intently for any sound. My heart raced as footsteps echoed down the hallway. Suddenly, a loud crash against the door made me jump. The wood splintered as Mike forced his way in, his eyes wild with rage. Thought you could get away, didn't you? He snarled, advancing toward me. Desperation took over, and I grabbed the nearest thing I could find, a heavy lamp. As he lunged, I swung it with all my might, the impact sending him staggering back, clutching his head. The momentary advantage was all I needed. I bolted past him, adrenaline propelling me forward. I raced down the hallway, my pulse pounding in my ears, and burst into the motel lobby, shouting for help. The police arrived just in time, their sirens a welcome sound. Mike, disoriented and bleeding, stumbled out of the room, only to be tackled by Officer Davis and his team. They handcuffed him, his menacing presence finally subdued. Are you all right? Officer Davis asked, guiding me to a chair. I nodded, too shaken to speak. He explained that Mike was a wanted criminal with a long history of stalking and violence. We've been after him for months. You did the right thing by contacting us, he said, his tone reassuring. Though my body trembled with residual fear, I felt a strange sense of relief knowing that Mike was no longer a threat. The ordeal had been harrowing, but my actions had helped capture a dangerous man. I knew I had narrowly escaped a far worse fate. Working out at the gym in Boston had become my daily routine, a place where I could focus on my fitness goals and escape the stresses of my busy life. My friend Jess often joined me for our evening sessions. Her company made the workouts enjoyable and motivating. We had our routine down to a science. Cardio first, then strength training, and a cool down with stretching. One evening, as I was lifting weights, I noticed a new member. He was tall with dark hair and an intense gaze that seemed to follow me everywhere. At first I brushed it off, thinking it was just my imagination. After all, it was a public gym, and people watched others all the time. But as the days passed, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. His eyes were always on me, no matter where I was in the gym. His presence made me uneasy, but I tried to ignore it, telling myself I was being paranoid. Over the next few weeks, the man, who I learned was named Luke, began showing up at the gym every time I was there. He always seemed to be on the adjacent equipment, mirroring my workout routine. It was as if he had memorized my schedule. He would smile and nod, attempting to engage me in small talk. Hey, I've seen you around. What's your name? He asked one evening, his tone overly friendly. I forced a polite smile, keeping my answer short. Ava, nice to meet you. Jess noticed Luke's behavior too. That guy gives me the creeps, she said one night as we left the gym. You should be careful. I decided to change my workout times hoping to avoid Luke, but it didn't take long for him to adjust his schedule to match mine. No matter when I went, he was always there. My anxiety grew with each encounter. It was clear that his interest in me was more than just casual. The once comforting atmosphere of the gym now felt threatening. I began to dread my workouts, constantly looking over my shoulder, feeling his eyes on me. Jess's words echoed in my mind, and I knew I had to be more vigilant. Luke's behavior escalated quickly. What started as casual conversation turned into him following me around the gym. He would linger near the machines I used, and I even caught him waiting for me outside the gym. His presence felt more suffocating each day. One evening, I found a small gift on the hood of my car, a bouquet of flowers with a note that read, for my favorite gym buddy. The gesture might have been sweet under different circumstances, but coming from Luke, it sent a chill down my spine. The next day it was a handwritten poem about watching from afar. 
Each gift and note became more personal, more unsettling. I reported his behavior to the gym management. They listened sympathetically and promised to keep an eye on him, but their reassurances felt hollow. Luke wasn't violating any gym rules, and they couldn't ban him based on my discomfort alone. Despite their promises, nothing changed. Luke continued his relentless pursuit, and my safe haven became a place of dread. The gym management's lack of action left me feeling vulnerable and exposed. My fear grew with each passing day. The notes and gifts became more frequent, and his behavior more invasive. I decided it was time to involve the police. I went to the local precinct and spoke with Officer Martinez, a kind but serious officer who took my statement. I need you to document every interaction, he advised. Keep a record of his messages and any encounters. It will help us build a case. Despite involving the police, Luke's stalking intensified. He somehow hacked into my social media accounts, sending me threatening messages from my own profiles. It felt like he was everywhere, monitoring my every move. The sense of violation was overwhelming. Taking Officer Martinez's advice to heart, I installed security cameras around my home and changed the locks on my doors. Every creak and shadow made me jump. I felt trapped, constantly looking over my shoulder, wondering when Luke might strike next. The walls of my once safe world were closing in, and I knew I had to find a way to reclaim my life from this nightmare. One evening, as I was scrolling through my messages, a notification popped up from a member of the gym's online community. She had seen Luke's picture and warned me that he wasn't who he claimed to be. After some quick research, I discovered that Luke was using a fake name. His real name was David, and he had a history of stalking and violence against women. My blood ran cold as I read the articles detailing his past crimes. That same evening at the gym, David confronted me in the locker room. He cornered me against the cold tiles, his face twisted in anger. I know about your little police report, he hissed. You need to drop it. You have no idea what I'm capable of. My heart pounded in my chest. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, Jess walked in. She immediately sensed the danger and shouted, Get away from her! The distraction gave me the chance to push past him and run. Together, Jess and I fled the gym, our breaths ragged with fear. We called the police as soon as we reached my car. Officer Martinez reassured us that they would catch David, but the fear that he would come after us lingered. The police arrived at the gym within minutes, but David had already vanished. Officer Martinez initiated a citywide search, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was always one step ahead. Jess insisted I stay at her apartment for safety, and I gratefully accepted. Days passed, and I started to feel a semblance of security. Then, late one night, we heard a window shatter. David had found us. He broke into the apartment, his eyes wild and menacing. The fear was paralyzing, but I knew we had to act fast. In the chaos, I grabbed a kitchen knife, the only weapon within reach. As David lunged at us, I swung the knife, catching him off guard and injuring him. He stumbled back, giving Jess and me just enough time to escape the apartment and call for help. The police arrived swiftly, and this time, they managed to apprehend David as he tried to flee. He was finally taken into custody, his reign of terror brought to an end. The relief was overwhelming, but the ordeal had left its mark on both Jess and me. We had faced a real-life nightmare and survived, but the scars would take time to heal. As the police surrounded the apartment building, David attempted to flee, but he was quickly apprehended. Handcuffs secured, he was arrested and charged with multiple counts of stalking, harassment, and attempted assault. Seeing him taken away was a moment of immense relief for both Jess and me. Officer Martinez approached us with a reassuring smile. He's not going to hurt anyone else, he said firmly. With the evidence we've gathered, David will face significant jail time. His words brought a measure of peace to my frazzled nerves. The legal process began swiftly, and David's history of violence and stalking worked against him in court. Knowing that he would be off the streets for a long time helped me start to reclaim a sense of normalcy. It wasn't just about my safety anymore. It was about ensuring he couldn't harm anyone else. Jess and I leaned on each other for support, our bond stronger than ever. The experience had been harrowing, but it also highlighted the importance of friendship and vigilance. As I resumed my fitness journey, 
I took extra precautions. I switched gyms, varied my workout routines, and stayed alert to my surroundings. The experience left me with lingering fears, but it also instilled in me a sense of empowerment and resilience. Running along the Charles River, I felt a renewed sense of freedom. The trauma of the past months had not broken me. It had made me stronger. I was determined not to let fear control my life. Instead, I embraced each day with vigilance and strength, knowing I had faced and overcome a terrifying ordeal. Arriving in Boston for my work conference felt exhilarating. I had found a chic downtown apartment on Airbnb, and the photos had promised a stylish, comfortable stay. When I pulled up to the address, I was pleased to find it looked even better in person. Eric, the host, was waiting outside, smiling warmly as he greeted me. Welcome to Boston, Mia. I hope you'll love the apartment, he said, opening the door and helping me with my luggage. Eric gave me a thorough tour, pointing out the modern amenities, a sleek kitchen with stainless steel appliances, a cozy living room with a big screen TV, and a spacious bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. The location is perfect, he continued. You're within walking distance of great restaurants, shops, and the conference center. As he left, I thanked him, feeling impressed by the place, but also experiencing a slight unease I couldn't quite place. I shook it off, attributing it to travel fatigue and the unfamiliar environment. The first couple of days in Boston were great. I attended my conference, explored the city, and enjoyed the comfort of the apartment. But soon, I started noticing oddities. Items seemed to move on their own. My phone charger wasn't where I left it, and my laptop began acting strangely, turning on and off by itself. At night, I heard strange noises, soft creaks and faint whispers that made my skin crawl. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I tried to convince myself it was just an old building settling, but the unease grew stronger. Then, one evening, I received a message from an unknown number. When I opened it, my heart sank. It was a video clip of me in the apartment, taken without my knowledge. The accompanying message demanded money in exchange for not releasing the footage online. Panic set in as I realized the extent of the invasion. Someone had been spying on me, and they had access to every private moment I thought I had. The chic, stylish apartment now felt like a trap, and the unease I had brushed off earlier returned with full force. I knew I had to act quickly and carefully to uncover the truth behind this violation. My hands were trembling as I reread the threatening message. I couldn't ignore the creeping suspicion any longer. I started a thorough search of the apartment, my heart pounding in my chest. It didn't take long to find the hidden cameras. They were skillfully placed, almost invisible to the casual observer. There was one in the bedroom, cleverly disguised within a digital clock, and another in the bathroom concealed behind a vent. My mind raced as I pieced everything together. Eric's overly friendly demeanor suddenly took on a sinister undertone. He had access to the apartment and seemed to know too much about my schedule and habits. It had to be him. Determined to gather evidence, I took photos and videos of the cameras in their locations. I documented everything meticulously, including the interactions I had with Eric. I needed solid proof to ensure that he couldn't wriggle out of this. The next morning, I went to the local police station and met Detective Riley. She was calm and professional, listening intently as I poured out my story. I found hidden cameras in the apartment, I explained, showing her the evidence I had gathered. Detective Riley nodded, taking notes. This is serious, Mia. We'll investigate, but we need more evidence to act directly against Eric. Can you stay in the apartment for another night and keep a low profile? We'll monitor the situation closely. The thought of staying another night made my skin crawl, but I knew it was necessary. All right, I'll do it, I agreed, my voice steady despite the fear gnawing at me. That night, as I was trying to stay calm and alert, I found a small drawer in the living room that I hadn't noticed before. Inside was a crumpled piece of paper with a name and number, Clara. A chill ran down my spine. Was she another victim? I immediately called her. Clara, this is Mia. I'm staying in an Airbnb hosted by Eric. Did he... Yes, Clara interrupted, her voice trembling. He did the same thing to me. 
I've been too scared to come forward. Please, we need to stop him. Clara's words gave me the strength to push forward. With Detective Riley's help and Clara's testimony, I felt a glimmer of hope that we could end Eric's predatory game. After my chilling conversation with Clara, the gravity of the situation became even clearer. She confirmed my worst fears. Eric had been blackmailing her with incriminating footage for months, and she had been paying him to keep it quiet. Clara's voice trembled as she recounted her ordeal, but despite her fear, she agreed to help me and the police catch Eric. With Clara on board, we devised a plan with Detective Riley, but Eric must have sensed something was amiss. That evening, as I was nervously preparing to meet Detective Riley for a final briefing, there was a knock on the door. I opened it to find Eric standing there, his friendly mask replaced with a menacing glare. I know what you're doing, Mia, he hissed, stepping into the apartment. You think you can get away with reporting me to the police? Think again. My heart pounded as I tried to stay calm. Eric, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't play dumb, he snapped, grabbing my arm. I have friends in high places. Drop this, or you'll regret it. Fear threatened to paralyze me, but I managed to nod, hoping he would leave. Eric finally released me and stormed out, leaving me shaken, but more determined than ever. Detective Riley and her team quickly set up a sting operation. Mia and Clara's help was crucial to catching Eric in the act. The plan was simple. Eric would think he was meeting me alone to extort more money, but the police would be ready to intervene. The next evening, with a wire hidden under my clothes and my heart racing, I waited in the apartment for Eric. Right on cue, he showed up, his face twisted with arrogance and malice. You've made a big mistake, Mia, he said, stepping inside. I played along, pretending to be scared and compliant. Please, Eric, I'll do whatever you want. Just don't release the footage. As Eric began his usual threats and demands, Detective Riley and her team burst in. Boston PD, Eric, you're under arrest. Caught off guard, Eric tried to flee, shoving past the officers and bolting down the hallway. The building erupted into chaos. I ran after them, adrenaline fueling my every step. Eric's desperation led him to the rooftop, where he thought he could escape. But I wasn't about to let him get away. As Eric reached the edge, I grabbed a loose pipe and swung it towards him. He stumbled, buying just enough time for Detective Riley and her team to tackle him to the ground. Handcuffs secured around his wrists, Eric's reign of terror was finally over. The police confiscated the hidden footage and took him away, ensuring he couldn't harm anyone else. The ordeal had been terrifying, but with Clara's bravery and Detective Riley's support, we had put an end to Eric's predatory game. Eric was swiftly charged with multiple counts of blackmail, invasion of privacy, and harassment. The extent of his crimes, spanning numerous victims, meant that the evidence against him was overwhelming. Detective Riley assured Clara and me that Eric would face significant jail time and that every piece of incriminating footage would be destroyed. Thank you for your bravery, Detective Riley said offering a reassuring smile. You've helped put a dangerous man behind bars. The relief was palpable, yet a lingering fear remained. The invasion of privacy had left a deep scar, and the thought of someone violating my personal space so profoundly would take time to heal. Clara and I exchanged grateful glances, our shared experience forging a bond of resilience and support. Despite the lingering uneasy, I felt immense gratitude for the unwavering support from Clara and the diligent efforts of Detective Riley and her team. Knowing that Eric could no longer harm anyone else provided a measure of comfort. As the work conference continued, I approached each day with heightened awareness and precaution. My experience had taught me the importance of vigilance and the power of community in overcoming adversity. Every summer, my family and I escaped to our summer house in Rockport, Massachusetts. It's a quaint coastal town where everyone knows everyone, and life moves a little slower. This year was no different. I picked up my usual summer job at the local grocery store owned by the Millers, a sweet old couple who treated me like their own grandchild. One evening, while I was stacking shelves, I noticed a drifter hanging around the store. He looked out of place with his scruffy clothes and unkempt beard. His eyes darted around, watching the employees and customers with a creepy intensity. 
I felt a shiver run down my spine. Something about him made me uneasy, but I brushed it off. Small towns always had their share of oddballs, right? Can I help you with something? I asked, trying to sound polite. He didn't respond, just kept staring. I forced a smile and returned to my work, hoping he'd leave soon. After a while, he wandered out of the store, but the uneasy feeling lingered. Over the next few days, I started seeing the drifter, who I learned was named Tom, more frequently. He'd hang around the store, lurking in the parking lot or just standing nearby, watching. His behavior was becoming more unsettling. He'd make creepy comments to me and the other employees, things that sent chills down my spine. Nice day, isn't it? You look like you've got a lot on your mind, he'd say, his tone dripping with something I couldn't quite place. One evening, my sister Kate came home looking shaken. I saw that guy from your work, the creepy one. He was lurking near our house, she told us, her voice trembling. My parents were immediately concerned. We reported it to the local authorities, but they were slow to take action. He's probably harmless, just a drifter passing through, the sheriff said, trying to reassure us. But Tom's presence didn't feel harmless. It felt invasive, like he was watching and waiting for something. My family grew more anxious with each passing day. The once peaceful summer house now felt like a place of dread, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being hunted. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I decided to take out the trash. As I approached the garage, I heard a faint rustling sound. I froze, straining to listen. Suddenly, I saw Tom trying to jimmy open the garage door with a crowbar. My heart raced. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I shouted, adrenaline surging through my veins. Tom looked up, his eyes wild with anger, then bolted into the woods behind our house. I stood there, breathless and shaken, before running back inside to tell my family. We immediately called Sheriff Lawson, who arrived shortly after. He took our statement, his brow furrowed with concern. I'll keep an eye on the situation, he promised, but our resources are limited. We'll do our best. The next morning, we found a note on our porch. The handwriting was messy and aggressive. Stay out of my business, or else. The threat was clear, and fear settled over our home like a dark cloud. Tom's behavior became more aggressive with each passing day. One morning, we woke up to find our summer house vandalized. Windows were smashed, and the walls were defaced with disturbing graffiti. My dad's car tires were slashed, leaving us feeling trapped and vulnerable. We felt helpless as Tom's actions grew bolder and more violent. The sense of safety we once felt in our summer home was replaced with constant anxiety. Sheriff Lawson visited us again, advising us to install security cameras and to stay indoors after dark. We need to document everything, he said. It'll help us build a case against him. We followed his advice, setting up cameras around the house and sticking together inside after sunset. But the fear was inescapable. Every creak of the house, every shadow, made us jump. Tom's presence loomed over us, a constant reminder that our safety was under threat. As the days went by, the tension in our home grew unbearable. We knew we had to find a way to end this nightmare, but we didn't know how. Tom's relentless harassment had pushed us to our breaking point, and we were desperate for a solution. Kate and I couldn't take it anymore. We needed answers. We spent hours on the internet, digging into public records and local news archives. What we found sent shivers down our spines. Tom had a long criminal record, including assault and burglary. It was clear he was dangerous. Our search led us to an abandoned shack on the outskirts of Rockport. The place was dilapidated, hidden away among the trees. We crept closer, peeking inside through a broken window. The sight was chilling. The shack was filled with stolen items and crude maps of our neighborhood. It was a makeshift lair, and it confirmed our worst fears. Tom had been stalking multiple families, not just ours. We hurried to relay our findings to Sheriff Lawson. He organized a search of the shack, but when his team arrived, it was empty. However, they found enough evidence to suggest Tom had been living there and tracking his victims meticulously. The sheriff's concern was palpable. We're dealing with someone very dangerous, he said. We'll increase patrols, but you need to stay vigilant. That night, I lay in bed, unable to sleep, haunted by the images of Tom's lair. 
Sometime after midnight, I heard a faint noise coming from downstairs. My heart pounded as I got up to investigate. As I descended the stairs, I saw Tom inside our house, rifling through our belongings. The sight of him in our living room ignited a surge of adrenaline. Get out! I shouted, charging at him. A violent struggle ensued. Tom was strong and desperate, but I fought back with everything I had. In the chaos, I managed to knock him off balance. As we grappled, he dropped something, a burner phone. I snatched it up, hoping it held some answers. Who are you working for? I demanded. But Tom just snarled and broke free, escaping through the back door. Shaken and bruised, I clutched the phone and called Sheriff Lawson. When he arrived, I showed him the device. Together, we went through the messages. They revealed a series of incriminating texts from an unknown individual who seemed to have a vendetta against my family. The texts detailed our movements, providing instructions to Tom on how to terrorize us. This isn't just about Tom, I said, my voice trembling. Someone else is behind this, someone who wants to destroy us. Sheriff Lawson nodded grimly. We'll trace this phone and find out who's orchestrating this. But for now, you need to stay somewhere safe. The discovery of the burner phone changed everything. It wasn't just Tom. We were dealing with a far more sinister plot than we had imagined. The realization was terrifying, but it also fueled our determination to uncover the truth and put an end to this nightmare. We decided it was no longer safe to stay in Rockport. The morning light barely pierced the heavy fog as we hurriedly packed our belongings. The plan was to leave before Tom could strike again. However, just as we were loading the last bags into the car, he appeared, a wild look in his eyes. You think you can run? Tom snarled, brandishing a knife. My family froze, fear etched on their faces. Before I could react, Sheriff Lawson and his deputies arrived, guns drawn. They had traced the burner phone to a location near our house and had been monitoring it closely. Drop the knife, Tom, Sheriff Lawson commanded. A tense standoff ensued. Tom, realizing he was cornered, lunged towards my father. Acting on pure instinct, I grabbed a shovel from the garden and swung it, striking Tom's arm and causing him to drop the knife. Sheriff Lawson and his deputies seized the opportunity, tackling Tom to the ground and handcuffing him. Are you all right? The sheriff asked, helping me up. I nodded, shaking with adrenaline, but relieved it was finally over. Tom was subdued, and we were safe for now. With Tom in custody, the investigation quickly unraveled the mystery behind the vendetta. The unknown individual behind the scheme turned out to be a former business rival of my father's. Years ago, a business deal had gone sour, and the rival had harbored a deep-seated grudge. He had hired Tom to terrorize us as an act of revenge. The authorities assured us that both Tom and the mastermind would face serious charges. The relief was immense, but the psychological scars remained. The once idyllic summer house now felt tainted by the horrors we had endured. Despite the resolution, we decided to sell the summer house. It no longer felt like a safe haven. Instead, it was a constant reminder of the nightmare we had lived through. We needed a fresh start, a place where we could rebuild our sense of security and peace. As we drove away from Rockport for the last time, I looked back at the house, feeling a mixture of sorrow and relief. The past months had tested us in ways we never imagined, but we had come out stronger, united by our determination to protect each other. Moving forward, we carried the lessons of vigilance and resilience, ready to create new, safer memories together. Living alone in Greenfield, Massachusetts was a peaceful existence. As a retired detective, I cherished the quiet life, tending to my garden and diving into crime novels. My daughter, Sarah, visited often, bringing life and laughter into the old house. One evening, while Sarah was away on a business trip, the power suddenly went out. The house was plunged into darkness, and my instincts kicked in. Grabbing a flashlight, I headed to the basement to check the circuit breaker. As I was inspecting the breaker, a sudden noise reached my ears, the unmistakable sound of glass breaking from upstairs. My heart pounded as I realized someone was breaking into my home. Panic surged through me as I quickly hid in the basement and dialed 911. The darkness felt oppressive, and every sound was amplified. 
I listened intently as the intruder moved through the house, their flashlight casting flickering beams of light through the cracks in the floorboards above. Officer Daniels arrived swiftly, but the intruder had already fled by the time he got there. We discovered that the power line to the house had been cut cleanly, indicating a premeditated attack. The police found a few footprints outside and a discarded cigarette butt, but it wasn't much to go on. My heart raced as the realization sank in. This was no random break-in. My mind wandered back to a case from 10 years ago. A violent criminal named Mike, who I had arrested, had vowed revenge as he was led away in handcuffs. The memory sent a chill down my spine. Could it really be him? The timing seemed too perfect to be a coincidence. I shared my suspicions with Officer Daniels, explaining the details of Mike's arrest and his threats. Daniels listened intently, nodding as he took notes. I'll look into Mike's current whereabouts, he promised. Despite his reassurance, I couldn't shake the feeling of impending danger. I knew I had to dig deeper into Mike's past and current activities if I wanted to protect myself and my daughter. Determined to find answers, I spent the next few days digging through my old case files. Mike had associates and habits that I meticulously documented years ago. I noticed a pattern of behavior that suggested he might be hiding in an old warehouse on the outskirts of town, a place he had used as a hideout before. Armed with this information, I decided to visit the warehouse. It was a dilapidated building, long abandoned and covered in graffiti. My flashlight cut through the dim interior, revealing signs of recent activity. There were food wrappers scattered around, a makeshift bed in the corner, and, most disturbingly, a map of my neighborhood with my house circled in red. I took photos of everything and brought them to Officer Daniels. He confirmed that Mike had been released from prison recently and was likely the one behind the break-in. This discovery added a new layer of urgency to the situation. Mike wasn't just planning revenge, he was actively stalking me. The evidence pointed to a calculated and dangerous individual, and I knew we had to act fast to stop him before he struck again. That night, I received a phone call that sent a shiver down my spine. Mike's voice crackled through the line, dripping with malice. Miss me, old man? I've been watching you. Don't get too comfortable. I'll be seeing you real soon. The threat was clear, and my suspicions were confirmed. I wasted no time preparing for a potential confrontation. I set up security cameras around the house and secured all entry points. I even rigged a few makeshift alarms using old detective tricks. I was determined to be ready. Despite my precautions, Mike managed to break in again. The sound of shattering glass jolted me from my chair, and I confronted him in the living room. The struggle was fierce, each of us fighting for control. I used my knowledge of the house to my advantage, maneuvering through the familiar terrain. Just as I thought I had the upper hand, Mike delivered a blow that sent me sprawling. I scrambled to my feet, ready to face whatever came next. During the struggle, I made a startling discovery. Mike wasn't working alone. Another figure emerged from the shadows, someone I recognized from another case years ago. He was an accomplice from a past arrest, someone who held a grudge just as deeply as Mike did. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. As we fought, Sarah returned home unexpectedly. She walked into the chaos, eyes wide with shock. Dad! She screamed, rushing to call Officer Daniels. The sight of my daughter fueled my determination. I couldn't let anything happen to her. With a burst of strength, I overpowered Mike, pinning him to the ground. But his partner, seeing the tide turn, managed to escape. In his haste, he left behind a cryptic note that chilled me to the bone. This isn't over. Officer Daniels arrived moments later, securing Mike and checking on Sarah and me. The threat wasn't entirely gone, but we had won this battle. As Mike was taken away, I couldn't shake the feeling of unfinished business. His partner was still out there, and I knew this fight was far from over. With Sarah safe, Officer Daniels and I devised a plan to lure Mike's partner out. We used the cryptic note as a clue and set a trap at an old abandoned factory where I had once apprehended him. It was the perfect place to end this. The anticipation was nerve-wracking, but I knew it was the only way to ensure our safety. The partner took the bait, arriving at the factory under the cover of night. The final confrontation was intense. As he crept through the shadows, 
I stepped out, flashlight in hand. It's over, I declared, my voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through me. He lunged at me, but I was ready. Officer Daniels emerged from his hiding spot, and together we fought to subdue him. The struggle was brief but fierce. We managed to overpower him, securing him in handcuffs. The sense of relief was overwhelming. Both he and Mike were finally in custody, charged with multiple crimes that would ensure they'd be off the streets for a long time. Sarah and I were shaken but relieved. We fortified the house with additional security measures and leaned on the support of our close-knit community. Officer Daniels commended my bravery, reassuring us that both criminals would face significant jail time. Despite the harrowing experience, I felt a deep sense of closure. Helping put two dangerous men behind bars was a reminder of my purpose, even in retirement. Life slowly returned to normal. I resumed my quiet routine, more vigilant but determined not to live in fear. Sarah visited more often, and we cherished our time together, grateful for the bond that had grown even stronger through adversity. Mark and I had just moved into our dream home in Worcester, Massachusetts. The suburban neighborhood seemed perfect for starting our new life together. The tree-lined streets, friendly neighbors, and quiet evenings were everything we had hoped for. A few weeks after settling in, Mark saw someone running from our house one evening. The next day, we found a dead patch of grass under our window and started hearing strange clicking sounds at night. At first, we brushed it off as our imagination or thought it might be harmless neighborhood kids playing pranks. But as the incidents continued, they became too disturbing to ignore. The clicking sounds grew louder and more frequent, making it hard to sleep. Mark and I were constantly on edge, jumping at every noise. Our once peaceful home had turned into a source of anxiety and fear. One night, after another bout of restless tossing and turning, we decided to thoroughly inspect the house. To our horror, we discovered small, hidden cameras, disguised as ordinary objects. The realization that someone was watching us was horrifying. Our sanctuary had been violated. We immediately called the police. Detective Thompson came to investigate and found that the power lines had been tampered with, likely to disable our security system. Knowing that someone had gone to such lengths to infiltrate our home filled us with dread. The fear of not knowing who was behind it all consumed us. Detective Thompson found traces of a white powder near the dead patch of grass and took samples for analysis. It was a small but potentially significant lead. Meanwhile, Mark and I started asking our neighbors if they had seen anything suspicious. Most were friendly but clueless, offering little more than sympathy. One elderly neighbor, Mrs. Henderson, mentioned seeing a suspicious van parked nearby several times. Her recollection was clear and detailed, which gave us a solid lead. Using this information, Detective Thompson checked local surveillance footage but didn't find anything conclusive. The van's appearances were sporadic and didn't provide enough evidence to identify who was behind it. Determined to find answers, Mark and I decided to do some investigating ourselves. We started keeping a close watch on our neighborhood, noting any unusual activity. Every evening we took turns watching from the living room window, hoping to catch a glimpse of something out of the ordinary. One night, our vigilance paid off. We saw the suspicious van Mrs. Henderson had mentioned. We discreetly followed it as it made several stops at different houses, with people quickly exchanging packages at each location. The realization hit us hard. Our home was being used as a drop-off point for a drug operation. The dead patch of grass marked the spot for pickups, and the clicking sounds were signals for the exchanges. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place, but the danger was far from over. We knew we had to act fast to stop this before it escalated further. We reported our findings to Detective Thompson, who set up a sting operation to catch the culprits. He advised us to stay away from the house for a few days, but we insisted on staying to help. The operation was tense, and the atmosphere was thick with anxiety. We watched from a safe distance as the police monitored our house. Late one night, the van returned, and a man approached the marked spot. As the police moved in, a shootout ensued. Mark and I were terrified, hearts pounding as gunshots echoed through the night. Thankfully, the police apprehended the suspects, bringing a wave of relief over us. The immediate threat seemed to be over, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to uncover. While we were celebrating the successful operation, 
Detective Thompson received a call that changed everything. The powder analysis revealed it wasn't drugs, but a chemical used in explosives. The revelation sent a new wave of fear through me. The suspects in custody weren't just drug dealers. They were part of a larger criminal network involved in arms trafficking. Our house was not just a drop-off point, but a storage location for dangerous materials. The discovery of explosives hidden in our basement, undetected during the initial investigation, made our situation even more perilous. The danger we had narrowly avoided was far greater than we had imagined. Knowing that our home had been used in such a dangerous operation made us question everything. We were grateful for the police's swift action, but the sense of violation and fear lingered long after the immediate threat was gone. Detective Thompson intensified the investigation, discovering that the criminal network was planning a major operation, and our house was central to their plans. We were placed under protective custody, but I couldn't shake the feeling of impending danger. I insisted on helping the police from a remote location, determined to see this through. The police used our house to set a final trap. The criminals, unaware of the heightened security, attempted to retrieve their materials. A dramatic showdown unfolded. As the criminals entered our property, the police were ready. The tension was palpable as a fierce firefight broke out. The police narrowly prevented a catastrophic event by apprehending the criminals just in time. The entire operation was dismantled, and the threat was finally neutralized. Mark and I were shaken, but immensely grateful for the swift action of the police. We fortified our home with advanced security measures and leaned on each other for support during the difficult days that followed. Detective Thompson commended our bravery and assured us that the criminals would face significant jail time. Despite the harrowing experience, we felt a sense of closure. Knowing that we had helped stop a dangerous network brought us some peace. The fear and anxiety began to fade as we adjusted to our new reality, more cautious but no longer living in constant dread.